to another episode of Lost in the Farmer's Market Garden Life, where today we're looking at this specimen here. Now, this is part two of the Devil's Ivy discussion, where we're going to get into the brass tacks of Devil's Ivy. We're going to, we, since all the USA soil pH, exposure, height width stuff has already been covered, we're going in, we're, it's kind of a bit of a dive. So please, keep your hands in the ride, and don't stand up while the cart is in motion. Now, as I said before, its scientific name is Epipremnum aureum, and this specific variety in front of you is emerald. It is commonly known as devil's ivy. Sometimes they call it golden pothos, which is an allusion to its original name, where it was originally called pothos aureus, which means golden pothos, basically. But the name got changed a couple times, and suddenly they settled on Epipremnum, because it looks like another Epipremnum. They, you know. So... I'm going to start out by saying, continue that, with saying that it is in the Araceae family, that's the Aram family, which includes taro and a few other things, Monsteria deliciosa, which you probably thought was a philodendron, but it's not. Aureum itself means gold. Aureum, aureus, gold. Epipremnum, however, is two Greek words. Epa, upon, for instance, epipen. The pen is upon you. Um, if that were Greek, I don't think it was. I think it means something else, but still. Premna, which is the premnum part, means tree stump. This is a, ref a direct reference to the liana and epiphytic growth habit. Now, I'm going to have to explain that a little bit. As I mentioned, a liana growth habit is a plant that is long-stemmed, is a long stem woody vine that is rooted in the ground primarily, but uses trees and other means of support, which is exactly what this plant does. That's what it does. It and actual philodendrons legitimately fall under liana, and there are a bunch of other plants in the garden that would fall under this category. It's not that exotic. It's just cool to know that they named it, even though it kind of sounds like a old country liana may macadoodle or something like that, you know, like an old country name or something. But whatever. Anyway... The epiphytic part. Now, this plant can be problematic in the wild in certain places. It can Anything can if it's in the wrong place, if you plant it in the wrong spot. That's a given. We all understand this in this industry. I mean, wisteria, kudzu, you see where I'm going with this. This is an epiphyte in that it will grow on another plant, but it won't actively do anything to kill or hurt that plant. Unlike mistletoe and dotter and a few other things I can think of, which are parasitic by nature. However, again, by virtue of its growth in the right climate conditions, it can choke out another plant or kill diversity in the right conditions. Anything can given the right conditions. And I stress, I cannot stress that enough. We're going to get into that in a moment in where it's a problem, because I can think of one place that wasn't listed, and I can. there are two places that it's officially listed. But we'll get to that in a moment. Now, as I said before with the prior episode, Devil's Ivy is native to Mororia. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Again, folks, you can correct me in the comments section. These videos, the prior video with the pronunciation hasn't been posted as of me filming this video, so I love to hear corrections. But anyway, that is in the Solomon Islands of French Polynesia. Okay, I need to warn you now. This plant is toxic to dogs and cats. Ingestion will cause an irritated mouth and tongue, but also vomiting, drooling, and swallowing issues if consumed in enough quantity. Some dogs will eat just about anything and keep eating it whether or not it's good for them. And so if you know you have a dog that does that, keep them away from it. Like, for instance, the lab cats. They'll chew on anything that is roughly grass-shaped, whether or not it has saw teeth, is bitter, toxic. And so I have to make provisions for that because that's their derp land. If you have a dog that eats anything, keep this plant away from it. Simple as that. Keep it in a room that the dog is not normally in. The bitterness of the foliage, and apparently someone ate it and taste tested it and found out it was bitter, I guess, should be enough, but I know of, I have landscaping clients, past, who had dogs that would eat wood mulch, like cedar mulch, literally off the ground. You never know. 
So better safe than sorry and an expensive vet visit. Beyond that, for you folks out there, if a person eats this plant, they may have a reaction that includes breathing issues due to swelling of the mouth and throat. So no eating and also be careful of the sap. Now, this is important for your children, really. Um, young kids have a habit of sticking anything they find in their mouth and a leaf from this brightly colored might end up being a problem. Now, it's not fatal. That's the good news. It's just going to make your kid really, really cranky and miserable for a while. So I wouldn't recommend it. If they eat enough, it may cause swelling and breathing issues, and that may be a trip to the ER. It's better not to risk it. Just keep the plant out of the way. Okay? Now, we're moving on to one of its positive virtues, because we do have to talk about this. Devil's Ivy was in on NASA's top air purifying tests because they want to see what plants would work in a space station for recycling air and stuff and taking toxins out of the air. And they found out that it is an air purifying plant and it removes specifically benzene, formaldehyde, xylene, and toluene from the air. Not bad. These are about the same chemicals that a snake plant takes out of the air. So double not bad? Okay. Except this one is way more vigorous and you can practically literally see this sucker grow. Which, by the way, I forgot to mention, this variety that you see before you is called Emerald. It is a traditional devil's ivy. It looks like the traditional picture of golden pothos that you might find. However, I got it because of the expressive variegation. It's not exactly golden. It's sort of a cream color, but the splotching was attractive to me. And this is a cutting of the main plant that is violently assaulting my terrarium. That's in the other room. It's not as photogenic. But anyway, now you know. So, moving on. About that invasive thing I, I teased you with, this plant is considered invasive in Sri Lanka and South Africa. Now, beyond that, I've seen that it is everywhere in somewhere else. Hawaii. A few years back, and I don't remember how long it was, I was watching 60 Minutes, and they had this interview with Bruno Mars, of all people. And he was showing them where his family used to have to stay in, I believe it's Hawaii, and he was just walking around. And he's like, "There's we stayed in this building, this abandoned building. And what was growing on the trees in the side of the building? Something that looked an awful lot like mature form devil's ivy. And I looked at that, and I stared. And... I couldn't believe it. I was like, that's plain green devil's ivy, and it's just growing loose in Hawaii. And so it may be an invasive in Hawaii if you, because, I mean, it never really gets cold there. It may be a problem there, too. In the Pacific Asia region, it's probably something that has escaped cultivation, as mentioned in Sri Lanka and other places. And there, I've seen pictures online of an acre of the stuff growing like kudzu in the wild, and it's just, it's amazing i'm like kind of impressed but on the other hand i go oh humanity's done it again dang you humanity you know so there's that now as for propagation this is more of a green type than the one uh, pearls and jade and enjoy is it's going to be like this pretty much the entire time but you can see in the back there some of the green leaves are more green than others and that's okay this is one where if it reverts whatever um, I'm not cultivating it for its variegation. I'm cultivating it for its vigor and its ability to clean the air and the fact that it's a house plant that requires very little care, which I like, considering that I have a lot of cacti. But that's, you know, pretty fly for a cacti. What can I say? Anyway, um, you know, the, uh, potting soil, regular water, but do not keep the soil wet or excessively moist, whichever definition you want to use. Fertilizer during the growing season, which is roughly April through, uh, I want to say, about November. You know, depending on what temperature you keep your house at. If your house is kept on the cooler side, then you can water and fertilize less in the cool season. You shouldn't really fertilize in the off season, the cool season. But if you keep your house warmer, this plant won't know that summer ended and you might have to fertilize and water more. If it gets root rot, you can snip off portions of the stem with leaves attached and preferably little root, the little root primordia, those little brown things sticking out and um, root them in water, which again, I note is kind of ironic that you're rescuing something from a moisture situation by putting it in pure moisture, but 
what ifs. And beyond that, this plant can survive almost any corner of your house, so that's a win. Now, its roots may or may not stick to, attach to, and grow through um, your cabinet tree if it's made out of wood. So just be aware of that. Now, I have one last bit of information for you in regards to devil's ivy. And it's a fact that most people probably don't know. It's flower. Okay? All plants eventually do flower. That is a fact of life. They all do. Now, whether or not it's special, worthy of note, or anything else, that's the difference. Even the tiniest plant, uh, I believe it's called duckweed, does eventually flower. It's just microscopic and you don't see it. Now, in this case, this plant doesn't. Now, here's why. This plant needs hormones to bloom. The last time one was recorded to have bloomed on its own was in 1962. And that's interesting. What it is is that these plants are cuttings of cuttings of cuttings of cuttings, right? We don't produce them by seed. And they have this genetic mutation, this genetic mutation that makes it harder or nearly impossible for them to bloom on their own. They require, I believe it's a specific hormone, gibberellin or something like that, I think it was, to induce blooming, which is... Interesting, because this reminds me of the problem with uh, Echinacea paradoxa seed, where you have to use this specific acid to get them to germinate, or your germination rate is in the toilet. It's there, but barely. Well, in this case, in this particular case, they require a hormone to bloom. Otherwise, they won't do it, which is insane. But on the other hand, that might be the only thing stopping them from being an inv a true invasive in some places if... The ones in the wild still have that mutation. So it kind of is an interesting balance in the act. So beyond that, that's what I have for you in regards to Devil's Ivy. This is part two. And uh, if you have any thoughts about any of that, please leave them in the comments section. I love to hear from you folks. The blog, the Forage blog, will be back sometime in January. I'm still guessing on a date. It's I know it says the fourth on the uh, next door posts, but... You know, in, in, on my other posts, it, I know it says the 4th, but I'm waiting to see how January starts and ends and all so forth. Um, beyond that, as always, folks, keep them growing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next episode.